Um, so thanks so much, course directors, um, Sakib, I guess you were here, uh, Mark and Kristoff, and congratulations for the third annual course. Um, I'm Sanjay Kanakundla. I'm also founding partner of Endoscopic Spine Institute of New York. I'm an endoscopic spine surgeon. And just so we know, where are the surgeons here? Just so I know who I'm talking to in the raise your hand right there. Oh, so pretty much everyone. Good. Full house of surgeons. So if I told you I had a magic wand that got your patients better faster, and I had two. I'm keeping one for myself. I'm giving one to you. <laughs> All you had to do was say yes. What would you say? Yes. Right? And if it also decreased your infection rate significantly compared to the current surgeries that you're doing now, would you take it? Yeah. OK. And how about it significantly decreased the amount of opioids you prescribe to your patients, right? Less opioids for your patients. Yeah, right? So I think you know where I'm going with this, right? That wand exists. It's called the endoscope, right? And it's, it's just not a fancy, cool way just to do a lumbar disc herniation. In fact, the application in the thoracic spine is sort of like this rallying battle cry to, to incorporate the endoscope into your spine practice today. And it's a true paradigm shift, right? Because in our daily practice at ESNY, and I'm sure all our practices, the patient is a hero, right? And we, as the surgeons, are just the guides. So that's to say that we emphasize non-surgical options, obviously. But if a patient needs a surgery, it's obviously going to be the smallest one in all our practices, especially if we incorporate the endoscope. So our message is clear for that. But it's also clear that even after they have a surgery, there's also potential endoscopic solutions uh, for that patient who's still in pain. And every case is treated with the same standard, right? Our surgical steps include planning, discussion, and expectations. So we include that in our surgical planning because without that, obviously, all the other steps after that are going to fail. And we know this, right? We don't treat thoracic pathology any differently. And the goals are for functional preservation, obviously, but the hope for functional recovery, symptomatic relief, and we obviously only operate if we have to. So progressive symptoms, pain that's failed, conservative management. For the surgeons, the setup is essentially the same as your transfer animal approach. We saw all the demonstrations. We heard John Ogunlade's talk. So that's the same. And this, of course, is after we performed thousands of endoscopic cases away from the thoracic spine, right? Synovial cysts, disc herniations, cervical decompressions, tumor biopsies, what have you, all to prep yourself and train yourself to, to, to tackle the thoracic spine pathologies. And still, the conversation is still the same after all that, right? And it's, it's, it's really the workflow that gets refined. So as thoracic discs come in all shapes and sizes and consistencies and locations, we have to start asking ourselves, and we tend to get on the conversations of, you know, what's the best way to treat each type of disc herniation? But the real question is, you know, what would you do for yourself if you had one, right? Your family member, your brother, your loved one, your, your, your spouse, right? So what would you do? What, what, what treatment option would you do or choose, especially when all the considerations are still the same, right? How would you minimize all these risks? Obviously, we would try to use the endoscope to minimize these risks, and we studied this, right? So even if you employ the endoscope to use uh, during these, these, these thoracic disc herniations, you can still follow certain principles to continue to decrease those risks of these thoracic cases. So missing shallow, we heard it before, but you don't want to get to your place by first docking in these areas of the red arrows. We want to go to these blue arrows, right? So targeting is crucial, right? Getting to the end point is crucial, but you have to get there safely. And you have to be safe with your x-rays because in the thoracic spine, all these things can look like the same level. So whatever standard approach you use to get to your level, but also make sure you're continuing to operate on the right level is important because with the scope, everything's moving. The whole thing is dynamic. Nothing's attached to the table. You have to make sure you're in the right spot and staying at the right spot. Then you start to identify your uh, anatomy, right? So uh, that's IAP, joint space, SAP, pedicle, and you start going through that, and you start working towards the epidural space, ventral to the spinal cord, 
you make that black hole bigger ventral to the spinal cord, and then you start addressing the pathology. <laughs> and addressing the pathology, when you, while you're doing that, you're gonna be using various types of instruments based off of your preoperative imaging, your MRI, your CAT scans. This, of course, as you heard me say before, this is like a stale cookie consistency with speckled calcifications. So you're able to remove this disc with a pituitary, and you should, you should be able to predict that from your preoperative imaging. But if it was you know, significantly calcified with a rim, you'd be using a drill more, and you'd be able to have to plan that. And of course, you need to know how to manage your bleeding. I won't tell my joke again for this, but, uh, you know, but maybe I will. So New York's in the background. You know, I call this going to Japan. Um, so we'll have to you know, look over this specifically in the, in the lab, but you have to obviously approach this with a little bit more purposeful and careful, appropriate trepidation because the spinal cord is somewhere behind all that red, right? So uh, at the end, you, you want to have a comprehensive decompression, and you should ultimately um, see all of this uh, ventral spinal cord uh, when you're done. So a few quick cases. I'll sort of breeze through this a little bit faster to, to catch up and get more lab time. But 41-year-old male with a bunch of weird symptoms. He's been visiting a, a physician who derotates his organs because it makes him feel a little bit better. That left-sided aching gets a little bit better temporarily. But he gets an MRI of his thoracic spine. He has a syrinx. He's seeing uh, neurosurgeons and neurologists, and they're telling him maybe it's a syrinx, and um, there's nothing we could do about it. But if you look at the pictures a little bit uh, with, with, with a little bit more detail, you see a T8, T9 on the left side. There's a frame in there that doesn't look um, uh, just quite like the others, right? And when you look at the MRI, it suggests the dorsal pathology. And uh, well, on the CAT scan, it, it, it supports that. But also on the CAT scan, we notice that you can see this rib head is almost fused with this sort of anomalous joint there. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to know earlier on that you're not gonna be able to stick a needle in there, you're not gonna be able to stick a tube in there. You're gonna have to know that as soon as you dock, wherever you're going to dock, it's gonna be bone of some sort. And remember, your pathology is going to be bone. So you're either gonna have to drill early or ream early or whatever, uh, whatever option you choose to get through that. So uh, this is exactly what you see starting out. And uh, you'll see all this bone. And for those of you who do endoscopic surgery, you'll uh, immediately identify that this is joint. But this is all the anomalous joint, right? So this is the joint space between what we would call that you know, anomalous IAP or, or SAP. And then um, we'll know that the, the nerve is going to be directly ventral to that. We stop with the drill. We make sure we're drilling in the right location. We take an x-ray and can you continue along that trajectory. And eventually, you'll see an exiting nerve root. That's a ball tip feeling the cranial pedicle sort of, sort of going into the plane dorsal to that exiting nerve root. So you can see that exiting nerve root right here going into the canal this way. And eventually, you're going to want to see that exiting nerve root going into the canal so you get adequately make sure that you've dorsally decompressed um, that pathology. So that's how we dealt with that. And how about this 60-year-old female with myelopathy for three to six months? Uh, you could tell on the MRI that uh, it's you know eccentric to the left side. The CAT scan shows it's moderately calcified, and uh, it's in the plane of the disc space. So you're not going to have to do any crazy you know trajectory changes within the surgery. If you're in line with the disc space, you're going to be able to take that disc herniation out pretty easily. So this is just a small video of it showing it. You want to get through that IAP, identify that. That, uh, that spinal cord there. And again, you don't have to do any significant drilling, um, cranial or caudal, because that disc herniation was uh, eccentric to the left side. Um, this is a larger disc herniation, categorized technically as a giant disc herniation, 47-year-old myelopathy. And it's eccentric to the right side this time, but this is T11, T12, so it's lower down. You can tell in all these axial cuts, there's no rib head in your way. So you're not gonna have to deal with that too much, but you notice a ton of other information on, this, on these pictures, right? You notice that it's you know, speckled calcification. The calcification is towards the left side, or the, sorry, the lateral side. And it's going to be just medial to this SAP. So as soon as you get through that SAP, you're going to see calcification. And as soon as you get through that calcification, the rest of the disc is going to be soft. So you have to like visualize all these steps in your surgery 
to be able to predict what instruments you're going to use at a specific time during the surgery. But also you see this hyperintensity on that virtual body, right? This is probably a mangioma that you probably need to deal with or have to be ready to deal with if you're drilling through that bone. What if it starts bleeding? You have to understand how to deal with that if you encounter that. So there's all these things you think about before sort of tackling these procedures. So um, when you, you do all those plannings, you dock. Here we want to get a little bit contralateral as well, because it's technically a little bit more broad based. So coming in at more of a flat trajectory to make sure you're reaching contralateral is going to be uh, important here. So that's after we went in and took out that lateral calcified disc. Uh, because on the approach, you actually remove that because it's, it's just inside of that SAP. And you can see the speckled calcifications within the disc herniation itself. That's all the way contralateral and ventral to the, uh, to the, to the spinal cord. You can see the cancellous portion of the virtual bodies. So that's bone, disc, bone. And that's all ventral to the spinal cord. That's the pedicle over there. And that's a decompressed uh, uh, spinal cord. 78-year-old male, broad-based disc, right? Just sort of like flat, maybe a little bit of bump over here on the left side, so we chose the left-sided approach. Again, rib head's not gonna be in your way. Calcification there, speckled, come flat, so you can go across. Now, when you want to go more and more across, you, you want to uh, drill a ventral space, because remember, if you're coming in sort of like a 45 degree angle, the more ventral you go, the more contralateral you go. So um, this is what Ray and I both call you know, connecting the dots, because you want to drill into the virtual body on either side of that disc herniation and then connect the dots. So that's sort of what we're doing here. We made a drill, we made a hole here in this virtual body and a hole here in this virtual body, and this is the line of the disc space and we just connect that, those two with that drill. So at the end, what you'll see is a nice decompression, bone, disc, bone, all ventral to the spinal cord. And this, how these pre-op and post-op images look, um, everyone gets a nice brand-aid after the surgery. Um, so that's a little fun. And then uh, some of these cases can get complex. So they require some complex planning, right? Because that's, you have to make sure that these things go perfectly, um, especially when they're not sort of routine cases. And one could argue, you know, any thoracic case isn't gonna be a routine case, right? So this is an interesting one because, you know, you can, if you look at these two axials, for any endoscopic surgeon, probably everyone on the course right now understands that there has been surgery, right? So, but the radiologists read this as stable because they weren't able to find the collateral damage from a uniportal endoscopic approach. So that actually required a phone call to the radiologist and say, hey, I actually did surgery here. Can you read that I removed the disc? And he's like, okay, yeah. So um, sometimes you have to have those conversations because people don't know to look for, if they don't see that dorsal scar, they, they're not gonna understand what happened, right? And this case is interesting because you can, you know, Ray's probably getting a little nauseous looking at this because he understands how difficult this would be because of all the various considerations, right? It's just like huge calcified thoracic disc going cranial caudal up to two levels. It's a small canal. It's a it's an acute apex rib. He's probably going to go bilateral on this. Like this is a really really hard case. But guess what? The patient's asymptomatic. I didn't operate on that one. <laughs> so. I want Easy. to ask you about that case. Yeah, we could talk so, about it all day, so, but yeah. So how long do you think it would, just go back for a second, how sure. long, realistically, a case like this there, how long would it take you? Because I mean, for me, this would be like a four or five hour case to drill this out. I, I think four or five hours, even if you did took four or five hours, it's still reasonable, right? We always talk about time for surgery, right? If you took four or five hours for this case, and the patient woke up with these two incisions to tolerate the procedure well, and they were still walking, <laughs> they're not going to say, why didn't you take two? Right? Um, I, I mean, sorry. Yeah. No, keep going. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> no. Um, I'll, 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 have you ever tried using like an articulating curette? So I have this, um, mm -hmm. I have two of them. One articulates up and it becomes like an Epstein curette. Yeah. And the other one becomes like an upgoing curette. But yeah. this one, you know, because when we do it open, you take like a downgoing Epstein curette and you make that plane between the dural tube, spinal cord, and the disc herniation, and you implode it into the defect that you created. Exactly. So that may make it so that you can still work slightly lateral and implode that disc without having to like just keep going more and more medial. So I was yeah. just wondering if you had that No, that you're, you're right. I love that instrument, right? It just, it, it's easy. It, it helps sort of create those planes as well because you can 
you can actually, it doesn't, it's not all or nothing, right? It's, you, can, you can sort of uh, tailor it based off of what type of grip you're using. There's like pistol grip ones and also uh, ones that you can turn with the dial. So there's various ones to change the angle. But I, I do like that instrument a lot. And the, the, the angle drills also help with that. This is how sometimes they can come out. This is the one you'd post on TikTok or whatever, right? This is a easy, nice plane there. It just delivers itself by sort of rotating this nerve hook, and um, that's exciting to have. But it's just not all show and tell, right? Our endoscopic spine research group published on this. We did a multi-center retrospective analysis on this, and we compared it with um, historical controls. And we found that, you know, compared to conventional approaches, um, the thoracic disc herniations done endoscopically had uh, significantly reduced invasiveness, obviously, less blood loss complications, and the decreased need for, or lower need for instrumentation and, and a shorter hospital stay. So the overall message here is that it's an encouraging alternative for con conventional approaches. So, you know, obviously I hoped I convinced you guys that, you know, the uniportal full endoscopic system is worth it to have in your armamentarium for some of these approaches. And um, you know, it's obviously best for your patients, right? And you're gonna have to do this safely. Some of these thoracic cases, if you're not able to reach that final piece, you leave it, right? If you're not able to get it safely, you leave it, right? If you're not able to see the end of your instrument while you're biting, you leave it because you don't get any redos from these cases. And again, we understand that these thoracic patients walk in, maybe you know, with a with a with a not not so perfect gait, but they walk in, right? You have they have to you have to guarantee that they walk out, and if they walk out with a disc remnant, that's better than not walking out with a perfect MRI. So um, you know, it's it's always best for your patients, and uh, you know, obviously for these thoracic discs, they, you know, they deserve a better option. So I think I think we're 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 creating that with with all the research that we're doing and all the you know pushing forward and and, and pushing the limits of these endoscopic procedures. So obviously, there's our group. Um, you can contact us and, and, and visit our website, and we're always happy to chat more about cases. This is ISERF, right, International Spinal Endoscopy Research Foundation. Email us, talk to us. It's instant access to all these experts, and you can ask us questions all the time. Beginner cases, we love to discuss. Um, so, so, so please just help us um, further endoscopic spine surgery uh, for ourselves, our practices, and our patients. Thank you. All right. In the uh